Hey everyone, Chris Lopez here, and today we're doing a short educational segment on one of the most common questions, and that is, should I put my property in an LLC? And it's not a simple yes or no answer. There's a lot of pros and cons and a lot of things you got to take in consideration. So I got two experts here with me today to talk about those pros and cons and things that you need to keep in mind. So the first is Joe Massey, who is a senior lender at Castle & Cook. So Joe, good morning. Good morning, Chris. Always great to see you. And my second guest is Peter McFarland, and he's a lawyer at the Business Innovation Group. Good morning, Peter. Hey, Chris. Hey, Joe. So uh, I think the best way we'll go through in doing this is there's basically like three ways people can go through or three options they have when they buy a property. Yep. And we're assuming that you're buying a property with a loan, with finance, because that's where uh, things get more complicated you want to talk about. Yep. So the first option is to get the loan in your name and then hold the property in your personal name. Yep. So Joe, talk about the loan side on that. Sure, pretty straightforward. This is the way all of our financing works for you know residential mortgages. Uh, Chris, you come to me, you wanna buy a property, great. I'm gonna ask you some personal questions. Where do you live, where do you work? Your personal name. You take title in your personal name. We close on the loan in your personal name. A lot of people get nervous about that because you're assuming all the risk, right? If someone falls, gets hurt, whatever, you're assuming all the risk in your personal name. Now, as a lender, we need to have this loan in your personal name because we're giving you the loan. So what I recommend in that situation is that you get a large uh, insurance policy, an umbrella policy for greater than the value of all of your personal assets. Make sure you work with your insurance professional on that. Um, and that's going to help cover you in one of those instances. So pretty traditional route, pretty normal. And when you're talking about financing, you're talking about the traditional 30-year conventional FHA, like just those loans that just are- Just a regular 30-year fixed rate loan, investment property, et cetera. Yeah, just a, regular, just a regular mortgage, just like we do all day, every day. Okay. So Peter, I'm going to punt this over to you because the L word of liability came up. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are the considerations there from the legal liability aspect? If I'm buying a loan in my name, and then buying a house in my name and keeping it in my name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I think liability really is the biggest drawback here. Um, from a lending perspective, and not to put words in Joe's mouth, I, I think it is by far the most straightforward way to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, is that when you come to liability protection, you are relying 100% on the insurance company. And uh, you know, there's there's gaps in coverage, for instance. Different policies uh, will cover certain types of harms, but then there's outs for the insurance company in certain areas for certain types of harms or dollar limits or other things that you have to keep in mind. Um, also, uh, the question of how much insurance is enough insurance, right? Um, the different types of harm may carry different uh, levels of liability, different uh, amounts of potential judgments. Um, and uh, also, depending on what your portfolio is valued at, um, you know, you, you need to think about how much insurance do you really need to be carrying, and that's a really difficult question to answer: is how much insurance to, to how much insurance is enough insurance? So, um, you know, if, if you're going to go the route of insurance. Um, you're, you're in some ways leaving yourself a little bit more open than some of these other options. And the main other option that I would consider would be putting it in an LLC, which of course is now going to complicate the discussion, yep. uh, and particularly from a lending perspective. But uh, what you've done by just adding an LLC into the mix is now created another layer of protection. Well, and, let me cut you off yeah, here because that's going to dive into one of the other points. And I know that gets into a very interesting discussion there. Yeah. Yep. Chris, so I'm going to just I'm say that. I'm trying to give you the segue here. You know? <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, perfect. You set me up. Um, so before we dive into that, talk about another option because this is a more straightforward one and that is getting a commercial loan from a you know local bank yep. and then and they will lend directly to the LLC so I can start my 123 Main Street LLC mm -hmm. go to First Bank or whatever local other local lenders and they will loan to 123 Main Street LLC mm -hmm. so Joe go back to loan side yep uh, tell us what a commercial loan is and sure. that brief process, what those terms are like, and we'll talk about the LLC. Yeah. So from a high level, you know, if you're getting a regular mortgage from me, it's in your personal name, you're getting a commercial loan, that bank is going to lend directly to the LLC. Now, this is not something that I personally do any longer, but I've done it in the past. I was a commercial lender for a number of years. And the difference is you're going to see the loan is to the LLC. The bank's going to want to see some history on the LLC, cash flow. Is it a brand new business? What is it? Um, they're also probably going to have requirements for larger down payment, shorter amortization, likely a variable rate, and likely a higher interest rate. 
Okay, you just those four bullet points. Go back and give some examples if you can. So the higher down payment, what higher down at? payment. You probably going to need a minimum twenty five, maybe thirty percent, depending okay. on the history of the uh, LLC. Shorter amortization. Most commercial loans are going to be twenty, maybe twenty five year term, best case, but it's certainly not going to be a thirty year. Am uh, fixed period usually going to be fixed for three to five years, whereas a mortgage like you get with me would might be fixed for thirty years. So, sorry with the fixed rate, so three five years. What happens after those? It generally becomes adjustable. Okay. All right, and can begin to change. There may also be a balloon at the end of three or five years, and you have to refinance out. So that's where you would want to talk with your commercial lender. And then fourth, higher interest rates. You know, interest rates on a mortgage are always going to be your lowest cost of borrowing money, whereas a commercial loan higher risk for the bank because they don't have you personally liable, personally on the hook, so they've got to make up for that risk by charging you a higher interest rate, which could be anywhere from a half to one to two percent higher than a traditional mortgage. So those four points combined equals a higher monthly payment and thus less cash flow in your pocket. But it comes with a super big positive, liability protection. Right, Peter? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's yeah, and and so uh, really, um, I it, when advising my clients, I always bring up this option because you know it, there's no kind of best approach here, but in my opinion, this is a really good approach, and and the huge positives of the liability protection. Um, you know, kind of uh, outweigh maybe some of the negatives uh, that, that you're talking about, the higher, um, you know, the, the higher rates, the higher payments, um, you know, whatever. Um, it, this, this approach to me, um, it, it really is worth considering because now you've paired your liability protection not only with insurance, but now you have this layer of the LLC. The LLC is giving you what they call the LLC or the corporate veil, right? And so if somebody slips and falls or, you know, there's a, there's a harm there, what they're going to do is they're going to sue the LLC rather than you personally. And so uh, the assets of the LLC may be open for judgment, uh, you know, up for grabs, so to speak, by that tenant. Um, but they're not able to pierce through that LLC and reach to your personal assets, your personal residence, your car, your retirement plan, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so now, you know, insurance is out there. There's, a, you know, potentially easy settlement money, whatever. But now you also have this barrier. And then, um, you know, you, you're I better in compliance, I guess, and this gets into our maybe next point, but you're better in compliance with what the lender is looking for. That's right. Um, and so liability also then from the standpoint of you as the borrower flowing to the lender is mitigated as well um, because uh, the, the lender knows what you're up to, right, and, and has underwritten the loan with the LLC in mind, right? That, that's right. Yeah. Great. And that brings us to option three, which is a blend of those two, which is getting a conventional loan through Joe or, you know, another conventional lender that's a 30-year fixed rate in your name. And then after the property closes, you can quick claim the property into an LLC. Joe, what potential issues are there there? Sure. So the first thing I've got to say is I work for the lender, so I have to represent what are the lender's interests. So I want to be clear on that. But I also know what happens in the real world. So when you close on the transaction, in the note and in your deed of trust, there's what's called a due on sale clause. And what that clause says is that if you transfer the property to another person or another entity, we, the lender, reserve the right to call that loan due. Which, for anyone that's not familiar, that means that we call up and say, hey, you borrowed $300,000. We want it all back right now. We basically expedite the foreclosure process because you've transferred the property. Now, you have the right to do that. You have the right to transfer that property because you own the property. But we, the lender, have the right to call that loan due when you've transferred it without our knowledge and without our consent. And just to clarify, I use the word quick claim, and that is actually just a common way to uh, basically quickly take the name from Chris Lopez and transfer it to an LLC at yep. 123 Main Street, where you actually don't have to go through the whole sales process, and it's just some paperwork. Exactly. You're just transferring it to your LLC that you own. Yeah. Now, Peter, mm -hmm. going back to we're in an LLC now with this option, what are the pros and cons? Yeah. Well, I, before I get into that, I may also suggest looking into and talking to uh, your attorney or title company or whoever you decide to accomplish that transfer because quit claim is probably the most um, common way that I see this done. Uh, but I actually don't draft quit claim draft quit claims. I draft um, warranty deeds. And the reason is because your title insurance is actually a lot cleaner that way. Um, right. and, and it doesn't create um, potential clouds on title. 
uh, in the future. So uh, look at your options. Um, you know, so talk about that for them because this is this is new to me. So I just assumed mm. everyone quit claimed because I've mm. never done this personally. So talk more about that. Well, sure. So in in Colorado, we actually have several different types of deeds. Um, the most common that we see are quit claim deeds, uh, special warranty deeds, and warranty deeds. Um, quit claim deeds. Uh, basically, what, what you're saying is whatever interest I own in the property, it is now yours. Mm -hmm. And so I could actually give you, it'd be perfectly legal for me to give you a quit claim deed for my interest in this building. Now, I don't own anything in this building, right? I have no ownership <laughs> interest in this building. But I actually could do that because what I'm saying is whatever my interest is, which is zero, is now yours. Okay. Right? Um, so so th there's that. Special warranty deed. Um, basically there, what I'm saying, well, we'll start with the warranty deed, actually. Um, the, the warranty deed, what I'm saying is that I actually have good title in the property, that I actually own it, right? Um, also, there are a lot of warranties that you make, but that, that's really the biggest one is that I actually have a claim to ownership in this in this property. Um, special warranty deed is backing off a little bit from that. And basically it's saying, look, I, I have good title in this property, but you know, I'm not really sure what happened with an easement kind of back 20 years ago or something. And so I'm telling you that I have good title to this property, but there's this one thing I'm not really sure about and you should be aware of it. And I don't make any kind of claims or okay. anything related to that issue, right? So there's kind of a way to back off of that. But at any rate, um, if you go with the warranty deed, um, your title insurance is much happier because Basically, um, and, and subsequent purchasers are actually much happier as well, because what you have is a continuous chain of all of these warranties going back to all of the prior owners and everybody kind of lining up in a line says, I have good title to this property. There's no encumbrances that I'm aware of, that you're not aware of, um, that there's nobody else who's going to claim that they own this property, right? And and you can trace that back for, for years and years, and in some cases, generations, all the way back to like when the state of Colorado actually owned the piece of property, right? Um, so that, that just makes the, the chain of title much cleaner and much better. Gotcha. So, okay, this is good. So uh, let's just say I get my loan through Joe, mm -hmm. and I talk with you, so you can tell me, help me figure out what way I want to transfer title from my name to 123 Main Street LLC, mm -hmm. and then what are the pros and cons to doing it that way from a liability standpoint? Yeah, well, I, I mean, from... From a potential tenant, your liability um, is is not necessarily any weaker. Um, a, a real common question that I get, and we were talking about a little bit before this, um, is uh, okay. Is the if if I if I do the transfer, is that a way for somebody to pierce through my LLC veil? Yes. Right. Yeah. And and Chris, you brought that up earlier. And and um, yeah, the the answer there I think is still no. Um, because what what we're doing is kind of looking at the totality of the circumstances and looking at all of your LLC and all of your corporate formalities, right? And so y if if you if you've done everything else you're supposed to do, for instance, you have a, a dedicated business bank account. You haven't commingled your bank account. Uh, you're you're really good about holding your your annual meetings and you keep minutes. Um, you've never let your LLC go on um, administrative dissolution with the Secretary of State, right? You continually file your periodic reports. You kind of live up to all these formalities. Um, that's going to kind of counterbalance any other kind of quote unquote failing of your formalities, right? And and so th I think this one particular transfer is such a tiny little detail, relatively speaking, in the the life of the LLC, but also the other really important things that an LLC should be doing that I don't really view it as a really big problem. That said, you do still have liability. The difference is that the liability is not to your tenant because your tenant is now on the other side of the LLC veil. Your liability is to the lender. That's right. Right. And and that's because you have done this transfer that Joe mentioned, and you are in violation of that due on sale, due on transfer clause. So um, it, it's, it's a matter kind of of, and when you're balancing the different approaches, it's a matter of weighing your liability and kind of looking at who are you liable to, right? Um, and in my opinion, that's why I always bring up that second approach that we talked about, um, where you actually have the loan underwritten in the name of the LLC, um, because it may be more expensive, but to manage your liability really in that complete sense, it's almost the best option, right. um, because now you're not open because you've engaged in this transfer. So through this third option, I'm getting the loan in my personal name and then transferring title to the LLC. It really limits my liability from the tenant from a personal standpoint. 
and assuming I do all the usual stuff you're supposed to do with LLCs and S-Corps and all that stuff, I do that stuff correctly, I'm very well protected. But now kind of going back to I've got my liability more open up to the lender, what are the downsides to that? Like, Joe, you mentioned, I understand I'm, I'm uh, violating the contract I signed with the lender. That's right. Uh, and you guys find out about it. Do you foreclose on me in a day? Am I able to possibly refinance or do you even know? Sure. So the reality, this happens a lot. Um, and the way I describe it is it's everything's okay until it's not okay. <laughs> right? You you transfer the property to your LLC. You continue to send us a check every month. To be real frank, we're probably not looking. All right? We're probably not paying attention as long as we get a check every month. Let me tell you when there becomes a problem. All of a sudden, we stop getting checks in the mail. Right? Something's changed in your life. You're not making payments on it anymore. We're going to start looking at that loan. Hey, what's going on? We're going to do some research. Hey, wait a minute. This property was transferred two years ago to an LLC. We need to call this loan due right now and exercise our foreclosure rights before this gets any further down the rabbit hole. Um, so in my experience, I've never had a loan uh, called due because of a transfer to an LLC. But again, like I said earlier, I work for the lender. I can't tell you that it's okay. I yeah. have to tell you there is this clause and we have the right to do it. I think your liability is probably limited to your ownership of the property and the amount of the loan. Um, so from a liability standpoint, think about that. If you have the ability to pay that loan off in full, okay, we're going to call it due and you send me a check for $300,000. Cool. We all wash our hands. We'll see you later. Um, you don't have the ability to pay off that loan or you don't have the ability to refinance it. That's where that can become a very big problem. And even though the LLC may now own it, you are still personally liable on that loan. We're going to foreclose, go through all those processes, and that's going to create issues on your credit, your future ability to get a loan, et cetera. And so let's say I do this. Is that the same thing as being loan fraud where I say, you know, we talk about house hacking where I'm going to buy a house as a personal residence. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move in there. And, you know, I've heard of people where they say, oh, I'm living in here. But they're not the living there. Well, they don't. And that's, you know, that's a big no-no because that's loan fraud. Is this that same level of fraud or do you even know? You know, I'm not an FBI agent, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, yeah. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily fraudulent, but I'd say it's outside the terms of the contract yeah. that you've agreed on with us. Okay. Yeah. So, Peter, I got a couple more questions for you because we're talking about liability here. And how does it work? Um, I buy my property. I get my loan, transfer the property to my LLC title. I've got two options. I can hire a property manager or I can self-manage. So I'm assuming if I hire a property manager that keeps things on, helps limit liability up and up, but if I self-manage, does that, what type of liability risk does that add in there? Because I'm now self-managing the property. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think, it, so, I'm trying to think the easiest way to answer this. Basically, um, it, when when you're looking at civil liability, which is what um, we're going to be looking at with any kind of, uh, I guess, what we call tort lawsuits, right? Um, torts are just kind of a fancy legal way of saying like a personal injury or for some reason you owed a duty and for some reason you didn't live up to that duty. So you kind of have to split where your harms are coming from and what hat you're wearing when the harm actually arises. Because if there's a problem, say, with the underlying property, right, there was a dangerous condition for some reason in the yard that you didn't mitigate and your tenant for some reason falls into that harm, right? Um, that liability is going to come to you as the property owner, as the landlord, right? The, I, I guess when I say that, really the property owner, not, not necessarily the landlord. Um, if the harm comes in how you're dealing with the tenant, right? Um, in If there's a problem with collecting the rent and you go over there and for some reason there's a problem with, say, the management or kind of the act of being the landlord and dealing with the tenant, then you're going to get sued kind of as that active landlord, right? Uh, does that kind of make sense, that distinction? It does. Can, can I, let me ask you a nuanced question here because yeah. I remember we actually had this fourplex in Inglewood under contract uh -huh. and... Uh, did the inspection, we ended up not closing the property, but there was a, I, 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 not kidding, there was a big old hammer laying on top of the roof, and it was like one of those big, like, you know, 20-ounce hammers, a big framing hammer. Oh, no. And when we were in there, one of the tenants said, hey, can you guys get that removed, thinking we were the current owners and property managers. We, you know, we said no. So let's say I buy my property, transfer to LLC, I'm self-managing, 
you know that and so if the tenant says hey there's this harm out there mr landlord mr property manager and i don't address it and then something bad happens i'm assuming me as a landlord will get sued and the property will get sued or that because that's just bad all over the place yeah well the 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 distinction i was setting up before was kind of I probably just went down a rabbit hole, huh? No, well, no, no, no. It's, it's actually good because it's good to use examples. I think it makes it more concrete, right? Um, the example I was, or the, 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 the distinction I was making before was going to kind of point back at what it looks like to actually have a property manager, right? Okay. Um, so let's, let's use your example, but let's keep kind of that distinction in mind. So if it's you, you're the property owner, and you're the property manager, and you don't move that hammer, um, Frankly, as the attorney representing the tenant, I'm going to sue anybody and everybody and just see what sticks. Okay. Right? And so then it's going to be on you to put up the affirmative defenses and say, I'm not the proper person to be sued here. Really, you should be looking at the other guy. Right. Well, in this case, there's no other guy. It's just you. You're right? the other guy. Exactly. Mm. So so there's not really any way to shift that harm or shift the liability or argue about who owed an affirmative duty to the tenant to make sure that that was a safe place to be and the hammer wasn't there and whatever else, right? If you have a professional property manager, on the other hand, you as the property owner, let's let's take the example a little bit further and say you didn't put the hammer there, you didn't even hire the contractor who put the hammer there, right? The, the property manager did because there was a repair that needed to be done or whatever. Um, you know, the, the question would be, okay, I come as the attorney, I sue you and I sue the property manager and I'm just going to see what sticks. You guys can argue it out between yourselves actually and say, you know, I'm the property, I'm the property owner here. Um, but you know, I, I hired you to take care of this stuff. What's your problem? You didn't vet this contractor who left this hammer up there. The tenant comes to you and tells you that this thing's up there and you didn't remove it. What, what's that about? Right. And then you make the argument and say that you owed the duty. You're the one that needs to be sued here, Mm -hmm. right? You need to make good on this harm and and then you make that argument to the court and say judge it dismiss me you know like I, i'm the property owner sure but actually this is so is such a gross kind of negligence thing that i had a contract with this property manager over here and the property manager was supposed to take care of it right and so you, you make those arguments and the judge may agree or may not but um that may be a way for you to say actually i'm not on the hook here right is that actually somebody else is on the hook so is it general because it's always been my assumption when i'm asked you know, the real expert, the lawyer, uh, does having a professional property manager help limit liability to me, the property owner? I, I think the short answer is yes. Okay. Um, and the reason is because a lot of the client facing and the potential harms that's going to come out of, I say client facing, tenant facing, um, a lot of the potential harms that are going to come out of dealing with people, right? Dealing with the people who are actually living in your uh, property, uh, that's all going to flow back to the property manager, right? Now, you as the property owner, Ultimately, you're still probably on the hook for many things, right? Um, I don't know how far. It's going to depend on what the harm is and the judge and what mood they're in and a lot of other things uh, when you make the argument that you should be dismissed, whether you ultimately will be, right? Um, but, uh, you know, even if it goes forward to, say, a civil lawsuit, you might have a jury, right? And it's really common for a jury to actually um, assign percentages of liability in these hmm. uh, tort cases. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And so, so they may say, well... You know, really, the property owner and the property manager are liable here, but, you know, the property manager probably is 80% liable, right? So there's something like that can happen. Okay, that's very interesting. But because uh, I'm a proponent of property management, I know Joe is as well. I love um, my property manager. And another reason to like property managers. All right, guys, so this was great. Um, we went over those three options, which are get the loan in your name, retain the property in your name get a commercial loan that lends directly to the LLC, or get the loan in your personal name, and then after closing, transfer title uh, from your personal name to the LLC. Are there any other questions or final thoughts you guys wanna chime in on before we wrap this thing up? I'd say there's pros and cons to each one. Um, I think it comes down to transparency. Be transparent with your agent, with your lender, and with your attorney about what you're wanting to do follow their advice, understand there's not one size that fits all for everyone, and make sure you understand what you're getting into. That is a great way to sum it up, I think. 
So, all right. Well, Joe, Peter, thank you. Now, if anyone out there needs help finding the property, which is the fun stuff, you definitely contact me, Chris Lopez at denverinvestmentrealestate.com. If you need help with lending, contact Joe. And Joe, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, you can call me anytime, 303-809-7769. Of course, my website, uh, loansbyjoemassey.com. And he'll help you out with uh, boring finance stuff. Yeah. And then uh, Peter, because people will definitely need some legal advice and legal help. How can people get a hold of you in your office? Yeah, 720-922-1120. And what's the best website? Oh, uh, let's go bigprofitsolutions.com. Great. And I'll put all these links in the show notes uh, with the video, with the podcast, with the text, all that. So thank you for listening. And we hope this helped you out. Thanks, Chris.